Today we're going to talk about condensing boiler system piping and how do we apply condensing boilers and how do we pipe them up to get the most efficiency. Let's get started. Kind of give you a little outline of our presentation. Uh, we're going to go over just what condensing boilers are, what they kind of look like and some features of those. Uh, we'll talk about how to pipe them up, whether it's constant flow primary, variable flow secondary, or maybe variable primary and a couple other options on how to do that. We'll go over boiler minimum flow rates and we'll talk about buffer tanks. Do you need one in your system or do you not? How to determine that? And then uh, if you do need one, where to put it? So let's get started uh, straight away. This is what a condensing boiler looks like. Uh, this is one of many brands available. This happens to be a fire tube product. The important note here is that it has flexible flow rates from 10 to 150 GPM. Here's another one. This is another fire tube product. Uh, flexible flow rates in this model up to 350 GPM. Regardless of the brand, regardless of its style of condensing product, every boiler's efficiency curves are going to look something like this. Uh, Mother Nature de determines, uh, dictates what these efficiency curves look like. It's all based on the uh, dew point of gas, uh, the combustion of products in the flue stack. And here's what we know. If you look at the right hand lower portion of this chart, return water temperature 140, 150, 160 degrees means we're in the non-condensing mode and we're somewhere around 87 to 89 percent efficient. The colder the return water temperature you see, the higher the efficiency. And that's true for every condensing product on the market. They all won't have the same slope, but they'll all look essentially the same. Lower return water temperature means higher efficiency. Now you'll notice there's three curves on this particular chart. And they're at 100% firing, 50% firing, and 5% firing. 5% always being more efficient than 50, and 50% 50 always being more efficient than 100 at a given inlet temperature. So what we notice is colder return water temperatures and lower firing rates get the most efficient uh, use out of that product. What does a water tube product, what does a fire tube product look like? A water tube boiler essentially has water in the tubes. In this particular instance, the tubes are in a 360 degree pattern. The fire out of the burner goes down between the tubes and the water runs through the tubes. In a fire tube product, the fire goes down the tubes and there's a large water jacket surrounding it. A lot more water volume typically in a fire tube product. That larger volume also lends itself to allowing us to do those flexible flow rates, which we'll get into a little bit later. Before, the only products that were available mostly were a lot of water tube type products. Um, they didn't allow for flexible flow rates because of the low water volume. If you design a job, this is important to note, if you design a job around a fire tube product, but you accept a water tube product, you may get yourself into trouble if you're going to vary the flow across that boiler. So make sure you get which the type you specify. If you want a water tube, make sure you get it. If you want a fire tube, make sure you get a fire tube product. Okay. Now you've already made the decision to use this condensing technology. How are we gonna pipe it up? Well, constant flow primary, variable flow secondary is traditional. You can pipe just about any boiler in that manner. And this is what it looks like. We've got boilers in the primary loop here with constant speed pumps. And then we have pumps and coils and all the system out here in the secondary and a variable speed system for that. This is the traditional method for piping boilers. You can pipe almost any boiler in this arrangement. Now before we get into piping uh, any further, let's review how you calculate the BTUs. There has to be a heat balance between the primary and secondary loops. And we calculate that with this particular formula, 500 being our constant, right? 8.33 times 60, the weight of water times 60 minutes. That's our 500 constant times GPM times the delta T. So here we have 100 GPM and a 40 degree delta T giving us 2 million BTUs. We're gonna use that throughout this uh, seminar. Why 40 degree delta T? You remember, lower return water temperatures mean more efficiency. So instead of designing for 20, we're starting to see designers stretch to 30 and 40 degree delta T. It means smaller pumps, saves you some money. Um, it also means lower return water temperatures, also saving more money. So. Let's start with this primary secondary example. There are three possible conditions that can exist in primary and secondary. No more, no less. Either the flow is equal in the primary and secondary, or one is greater than the other. Primary flow greater than secondary flow, 
or primary flow is less than secondary flow. Those are the three things that can happen. Everything in perfect balance, primary flow equal to secondary, or the primary and secondary out of balance. And that is okay. The heat will balance, just the flow rates won't. And that's why primary and secondary work so well. It changes efficiencies on you sometimes, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. So, primary flow equal to secondary flow, what does that look like? Well, it's basic. A 2 million BTU load, my boiler is on, and I have 100 GPM in my primary loop supplying 140 degree water. I'm designing around 140 degrees. Why would I want to do that? Because at a 40 degree delta T, I come back at 100 degrees, and that's very good for efficiency in my boiler. So, 100 GPM in my secondary loop going out at 140 degrees, and I have no flow in the common pipe. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I have 100 GPM going out into my secondary loop, I also have 100 GPM coming back. And because in this scenario we're perfectly loaded, which rarely happens, uh, we have 100 degree return water temperature coming back. That means my entering boiler temp is also 100 degrees because I have 100 GPM going into my boiler. Everything is perfect in an equilibrium, right? Temperatures are exactly the way we wanted it. Flows are exactly the way we wanted it. Rarely ever does that happen. So more than likely you're going to see something else. But let's think about this example for just a minute. Boiler number two is off, boiler number two is on, and it's running wide open at 2 million BTUs. Is there a better way to do this? Remember the, the efficiency curve that we showed you? That boilers operating at 50% are more efficient than boilers operating at 100% fire in this condensing type product? Hmm. Maybe we should do system efficiency optimization, we call it, where you run both boilers maybe at part load. Here's an example of that. <clears throat> we see this specified a lot. And if you're specifying this on primary, secondary, make sure you're getting uh, what was promised or what was advertised. You've got to pay attention to the return water temperature in the primary, um, especially when the primary flow is greater than secondary. With the constant flow primary variable flow secondary, system efficiency staging might not be the most efficient. Let's look at that. So I've decided to turn on the second boiler and let them both run at 50%. But because we are constant flow in the primary, I'm running two pumps. I now have 200 GPM in the primary loop, right? Two 100 GPM pumps supplying 140 degree water to the common pipe and to the secondary zone. Remember, I haven't changed the load out on the secondary. I'm still 2 million BTUs. So my flow rate hasn't changed in the secondary. I have 100 GPM going out to my building and now I have 100 GPM going across the common pipe because we're not using it in the secondary. And this is how primary and secondary works. It's perfectly okay, perfectly normal. My supply water temp is 140. My return flow rate and temperature is 100 GPM and 100 degrees. Again, I've got 2 million BTUs worth of load. But what happens down here at the entering boiler temp? Because I have 100 GPM of 140 degree water coming down my common pipe mixing with 100 GPM of 100 degree water my entering boiler temperature has gone up to 120 degrees. Here's the question. Is that more efficient? Well let's take a look. Remember the chart? Here we are. Return water temperature of 100 degrees is where we started, right? So now we're at about 93 and a half percent efficient we decided instead of running one boiler at 100%, we'd run two boilers at 50%. So now those boilers are operating at about 95 and a half, 95 and a quarter percent efficient. So we've moved in the right direction. But shortly after turning on the second pump and the second boiler, my return water temperature increases because of the mixing in the common pipe and we went to 120 degree return water temperature, dropping my efficiency down to right around 91%. So we've actually gone the wrong way. Um, and this is what happens a lot with system efficiency optimization and constant flow primary, variable flow secondary. <clears throat> so do we want to do that? Maybe in a water source heat pump job, we might want to consider it when our loop temperatures are very low. But in a job where we've designed around 120, 140, 160 degrees, it might not be the best idea. System efficiency optimization in theory works great. In practice, maybe not so well. So, that kind of puts us in the primary greater than secondary flow. Doesn't mean that's always bad. Sometimes we have to have primary flow greater than secondary. You always want to make sure you have enough boilers to meet the load. Let's look what happens here. I've got two boilers on. Now why am I running two boilers? 
Well, because my secondary is 110 GPM at 40 degree delta T, which is over 2 million BTUs, which means I have to run two boilers, right? To meet the load. <clears throat> I have 110 GPM coming into the secondary through the secondary pump. I'm supplying 104 degree return water. I have 90 GPM going down my common pipe at 140 degrees. And I have 110 GPM at 100 degree return coming back from the building. And we're mixing again now at 118. Um, again, not as efficient as if we were running one boiler, but one boiler wouldn't catch the load, right? Our loop would continue to get colder and people would be uncomfortable, so we have to run two boilers. This is sort of the disadvantage and advantages of primary and secondary. You can run multiple boilers, but your flow rates and temperatures are going to change, and your efficiency is going to move around based on whether primary is greater than secondary. Okay? It's perfectly all right. But what happens if primary flow is less than secondary? I mean, if primary flow is greater than secondary, it means sometimes our return water temperatures are elevated. Maybe we want to run primary flow less than secondary. Well, when that happens, it usually means there's been a load in, in, introduced into the secondary than more than the boiler, the boiler running or two boilers running can handle. What does that look like? So we're running at 2 million BTUs. Um, let's say we're in a hotel and there's a conference room or a, lot, a, a ballroom down the hall and they decided to open it up for an event. Maybe that room was kept at a lower temperature. When that room is finally turned on or set into occupied mode, the two-way valves go open on the air handling units and we get a dump of water into the loop, right? Or we get a, a, a load dumped into the loop. When that happens, the flow rate's gonna go up in the secondary. So all of a sudden our flow rate goes up to 150 GPM when it was at 100 GPM. Now I have 50 GPM in my common pipe, but it's going up this way and mixing here. What happens then? Well, the supply temperature drops because I'm mixing 50 GPM of 100 degree water with 100 GPM of 104 degree water, making 150 GPM of 127 degree water. If you design for 140 and you only get 127, you might have comfort complaints, you probably will. So what does that mean? We need to turn on the second boiler. So we'll have 150 GPM of 100 degree water coming back. We need to turn that second boiler on, otherwise you'll have the comfort complaints. This is also why in primary and secondary, we like to see our boilers looking at the secondary loop supply, this 127 degrees area right here, so that we know when it's time to bring on another boiler. When the secondary flow is greater than the primary flow, the supply water temperature will drop. So we don't typically operate there. That just took very long. That just tells us we need to turn on that second boiler. Okay. <clears throat> now, when we turn on the second pump, what happens? Remember, we were primary flow less than secondary, but now, because they're not perfectly matched, we're going to go right back to where we were earlier with primary being greater than secondary. So we'll have both pumps on, supplying 140 degree water, both boilers on. Our load didn't change here. Remember, we're still at 150 GPM. Now though, in our common pipe, instead of having 50 GPM flowing up and dropping the supply temp, we're gonna have 50 GPM running down the common pipe and changing our entering boiler temperature. But what also happens? We end up with 140 degree supply water temperature out to the secondary. We have 150 GPM coming back from the secondary. We have 100 degree return water temperature. And our running boiler temp now is 110 degrees. Remember, when we turn on primary pump number two, the primary flow increased 200 GPM. The secondary flow remained at 150. So there's some advantages and disadvantages, right, of constant flow primary, variable flow secondary. Um, the advantages being there's no flow through an off boiler. There's simple staging. Boiler flow will always stay within its limits. So let's take a look at what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of constant flow primary and variable flow secondary. Some of the advantages, uh, no flow through an off boiler, right? Whenever you cut a boiler off, the pump goes off. So you don't have those stack losses um, that can happen on a boiler when you run through, when you, flow, when you have flow rate going through the boiler and it not running. Uh, simple staging. The boiler is always going to stay within its flow limit. You don't have to worry about two pumps running through a boiler or a, a pump only going half flow through a boiler. You just nice, simple, turn the boiler on, the pump comes on, turn the boiler off, the pump goes off. 
Another advantage is that this system, this layout will work with water tube or fire tube products. It works great with condensing, it works great with non-condensing. You can apply just about any product in constant flow primary, variable flow secondary. Now, what are some of the disadvantages? Well, you definitely have to have a balance valve. Uh, well, you should. Um, some way to balance flow across the boiler. A lot of people use a balance valve, and if you do, that's some pump energy, right? Um, also, the boiler return temperature increasing is the primary flow exceeds secondary, which is going to happen a, you know, a fair amount of the time. Again, it's not the end of the world. It's how it's designed, but you will get some uh, return water temperature fluctuation. Now, definitely a disadvantage being that it doesn't allow for effective system efficiency staging, at least in your typical HVAC system. Remember, water source heat pumps will still work fairly well in this area. Okay. Now that we've covered the advantages and disadvantages of constant flow primary and variable flow secondary, let's talk about another way to pipe up your condensing boiler system, and that is variable primary. What's a variable primary system look like? Well, here's a good example. A couple of boilers, a couple of variable speed pumps, air separator, expansion tank, and some coils. And people started designing systems this way so that the boilers always saw the lowest return water temperature. Um, this arrangement can also save you some pump energy because your variable flow from one end of the system to the other. There aren't any constant flow, constant speed pumps here. All right, so we're going to pipe up this variable primary system. Do you see anything missing here? Well, one thing that's missing is isolation valves. These are a must. Isolation valves help reduce pump energy and stack losses, and they're also required for ASHRAE 90.1 2010. Uh, what does your state stand for ASHRAE 90.1? Well, you can look up it online. This map here is uh, as of July uh, 2016. But you can see where your state is in terms of the energy code. And ASHRAE 90.1 2010 addresses pump stack, pump flow, and boiler stack losses. And here's specifically what it says. When a boiler plant includes more than one boiler, provisions shall be made so that flow in the boiler plant can be automatically reduced correspondingly when a boiler is shut down and that's due to stack losses and pump energy. If you're not going to use the boiler, why would you pump water through it? All right, now that we know we need isolation valves, is there anything else we might want to put in this system to keep us out of trouble for proper operation? Well, look what we have here. We have two pumps down here at the bottom and they're in parallel. Is there any chance that those two pumps could come on together and run through one boiler? And the answer is yes, we've seen it, because the pumps are controlled by the building management system or the variable speed pump controller. They're not controlled by the boilers. There's also VFDs there. Do those VFDs have bypasses? Do they have manual mode? Is an operator going to come down to the central plant where these pumps are and say, you know what, we don't have enough flow rate out in the loop. I need to turn both pumps on. There's a chance you can overflow these boilers. And with too much velocity, you can erode the tubes and ruin equipment. So for a little bit of money, you can put an automatic flow limiter in there. We highly recommend them. We don't believe they should be an option. Make sure if you're going to do variable primary that you use flow limiters. Every boiler has a maximum flow rate and you have pumps in parallel. You can always end up having trouble. So we've added our isolation valves and our automatic flow limiters. How are we going to stage these boilers in variable primary? Remember we talked about all the staging um, in constant flow primary, variable flow secondary. Well, how do we stage in variable primary? It's different. The system is a little bit more complicated. Let's look at this system here. 2 million BTU load, 100 GPM through one pump, and we have 120 degree return water temperature and 160 degree supply water temperature. I need to turn on my second boiler. How do I get it turned on? Who's responsible for making this system work? Is it the boiler manufacturer? Is he responsible for staging the second boiler on or using the built-in boiler controls? Or are the boilers controlled by the BMS? Now, those boilers are going to need to have flow rate established before they fire or their safety will take them offline. How are we going to establish flow through boiler number two? Well, first thing we're going to need to do is open that isolation valve. What kind of isolation valve did you specify? Is it a butterfly valve? A globe valve? Does it open fast? Does it open slow? Or did you specify anything at all? What kind of equipment are you going to do in your project if you didn't specify what you wanted? Here's what we know. 
If we instantly open boiler number two isolation valve to establish flow, we're going to cut the flow rate of boiler number one and a half. Now keep in mind it was fully loaded when you stroke the valve open. And now, because boiler number one was running at 100% and we opened the valve on boiler number two, the flow rate through boiler number one is now going to be cut in half. Which means instead of a 40 degree delta T, we're operating around an 80 degree delta T, 120 degrees in and 200 degrees out. That's not good operating practice. We might trip the high limit of the boiler. It might be an automatic high limit. You very well might trip the manual reset high limit. If you don't trip the manual reset high limit, the boiler is going to cut off on its own internal limit and it's going to short cycle. That's not good operating practice. If it trips its high limit, manual reset high limit, someone's going to have to drive down to the job site and mash that reset button. Meanwhile, your owner is going to have a boiler that's inoperable, which means there's going to be comfort issues. So, what happens to boiler number one discharge temperature if you stroke that valve open? It's going to, it very well might go beyond the limits of the boiler and you may have some problems. The thing to do is to take B2 isolation valve and open it slowly. Talk to your boiler manufacturer. Ask the rep, what kind of time frame do I need to start and stop at the opening of this valve? And what do I need to do with boiler number one? Maybe your best answer is to take boiler number one and slowly modulate it down as you open the isolation valve of boiler number two. But you need to write that sequence. Now some boiler manufacturers can control both of these items the boiler firing rate, and the isolation valves. If that's what you want, you just need to ask for it. It's standard on some boilers, it's optional on others. But it's widely available boiler isolation valve packages and staging software. For some boilers, like Lock and Bar, it's built in and it's standard. If you want it, just specify it. Or you need your building management to understand that they need to bring the lead boiler down in its firing rate and slowly stroke boiler isolation valve number two, and that the stroking of boiler isolation valve number two, the rate of change should not exceed the rate of change capable of the boiler. You want the boiler to be able to slow down faster than the isolation valve is opening up. Remember, there's no need to turn on that second pump when staging on boiler number two. If the pumps are in parallel as shown, then we can have one pump running across both boilers. Keep in mind, the pumps aren't staged by the boilers. They're staged on the differential pressure sensor out in the system. And that may be by the built-in BFD controls or by the BMS. But pump staging in variable primary is not based on what the boilers do. It's based on what's happening out in the system determined by flow. So those are independent of each other. So what are some advantages of variable primary? Well, Remember, we do eliminate that return water temperature mixing that happens in constant flow primary, variable flow secondary. And we also get that pump energy savings, right? Because we are variable flow from one end of the loop to the other. Now, some disadvantages though are, well, we actually eat up a little pump energy when we add those flow limiters because they have a pressure required to make them work, two to five PSI to begin working, depending on the brand. So that may eliminate some of that pump energy savings that you picked up going to variable primary to begin with. We also have to make sure that the boiler stays in their allowable flow limits. And that can be a little bit tricky. In this particular instance, in this particular design, there's also always going to be flow through a boiler. Remember the pump energy and stack losses? It's wasteful to pump water through a boiler if it's not firing. But in this particular instance, in a lot of the designs we see, you always have to have one of those isolation valves open so you're not deadheading the pumps. If boiler number one and boiler number two are satisfied on temperature, we can't shut both isolation valves because then we would deadhead the pumps and have problems. So one of those would have to be programmed to, to be opened at all times. Make sure you specify that or that you design a bypass system around the boiler. The other disadvantage of this variable primary system is that complex boiler stage that we talked about. Who's in charge? Who is going to stroke the isolation valve? And who's going to determine what the boiler firing rate needs to be? So, another way to do this, uh, another way to pipe these condensing boiler systems is use variable primary, variable secondary. We think this is the great way to get that return water temperature down 
to get the most efficiency out of the loop. It also helps us increase pump efficiency over constant flow, primary variable flow, secondary, and it also can eliminate some of that complex boiler staging inherent in variable primary. And how do we do that? Well, we use ECM motor technology. This is a typical ECM pump. They're available from all the major pump manufacturers. And instead of using a large vari and expensive variable speed drive, we use ECM technology on these low horsepower or fractional horsepower pumps. And they are controlled by the boiler. Remember that constant flow primary example where the constant flow in the primary was greater than the variable flow in the secondary, and so our return water temperature was up at 118? Well, what can we do to decrease that return water temperature? We can change the flow rate, drop the flow rate in the, in the primary. And we do that with ECM technologies. Remember, we, we, we were operating down here with 118 degree return water temperature. And with ECM technology, we can go back up the efficiency curve by dropping the flow rate, matching the flow, the primary and the secondary. So here's our example. We have 110 GPM now with this ECM technology pumping 55 GPM across each boiler. We have 140 degrees. We have 110 GPM out in our loop, which is more than one boiler could take at the time. We have no flow in the common pipe. We have 140 degree supply water temperature out to the building, so everyone is happy, no comfort complaints. We have that same 110 GPM coming back at 100 degrees, so more than 2 million BTUs. And now I have that entering boiler temperature with no mixing in the common pipe at 100 degrees instead of 118. We've moved the right way up the efficiency curve where we have lowered the return water temperature and decreased the firing weight. So, how do we do that again? How do we vary the speed across these boilers? Well, we do it based on delta T. We program your design delta T where there's 20, 30, or 40 degrees, or 27 degrees, or 35 degrees into the boiler at startup. And the boiler sends a signal to the pump. If the delta T increases, we increase the pump speed. If the delta D decreases, we decrease the pump speed. This prevents from over pumping the primary, which minimizes the return water temperature to the boiler. It eliminates that mixing. If you can control your pumps this way, you'll maximize the boiler efficiency. Lock and Bar can do this out of the box with their standard boiler controls. If you want it, all you have to do is specify that you want variable primary, variable secondary. It's optional so for some manufacturers and it's standard out of the box for others. But if you want to do this, make sure you specify it in your boiler schedule. So remember our example, right? We went the wrong way on the efficiency curve. Now we were operating here at 100% fire with one boiler and 100 degree return water temperature. And now we move up the efficiency curves with lower firing rate, but maintaining that return water temperature. So what does that mean? Well, that means we can do this thing what I call true system efficiency optimization. Remember we talked about efficiency optimization or efficiency system efficiency staging and constant flow primary or variable flow secondary, and that it was a good idea in theory, but in practice and standard HVAC with temperatures in the range of 120 to 140 to 160, and it maybe didn't work out in practice. Well, here, because we're going to vary the flow in the primary, we can do system efficiency optimization now. So here we are with a 2 million BTU load, 100 GPM at 140 degree supply water temperature. But instead of running across one boiler with full speed one pump, I'm operating two boilers, both pumps at half speed, 50 GPM apiece. I'm operating one pump in the secondary at 100 GPM, so my flow in the primary and my flow in the secondary match, which means there's no flow in the common pipe. I still have my 104 degree supply water temperature going out to the building, so no comfort complaints, everyone's happy. I have 100 GPM of 100 degree return water coming back, so 100 GPM at 40 degree delta T, 2 million BTU load, and I have two 2 million BTU boilers operating at half flow and half fire, and my entering boiler water temperature is 100 degrees because I don't have mixing in the common pipe. This is system efficiency optimization, and it's built into a lot of boilers. They have this program already in them. It will bring on more boilers and operate them at low firing rate. And if we add the ECM technology, we can take advantage of this. So, what are some of these advantages of variable flow primary, variable flow secondary? Well, 
We eliminate that return water temperature missing just like we did in variable primary, right? We also have that optimal pump energy savings because we're variable speed from one end of the system to the other. Another advantage though is that there's no flow through an off boiler. There's no isolation valves, no flow limiters, no balance valves even. And we now can do true system efficiency optimization with this variable flow primary, variable flow secondary example. Let's talk about boiler minimum flow rate. Looking at the same system we were looking at before, let's look at a 2 million BTU boiler. Does your boiler have a minimum flow rate? Well, number one, you want to look and see what the manufacturer published in the literature about minimum flow rates. But you have to be careful. Some manufacturers will state there is no minimum flow rate across their boiler. And in theory, that might be true. But in practice, we're going to show you how that's not. Um, in certain areas, maybe you can get a really big delta T across your boiler. But we're going to tell you there's a minimum flow rate, and these are the numbers to show it. Okay? So be careful when looking at the manufacturer's literature. Also notice that some manufacturers might publish two numbers. They might publish a minimum startup flow rate, and then they might publish another number called the minimum post-startup flow rate. And the minimum startup flow rate is going to typically be a higher number. And then the minimum post startup flow rate will be once the motor's gotten started at a higher firing rate, it can turn down to a lower firing rate, and that number will go down. So if you see a minimum flow rate of 5 GPM published, there might be another published number of 25 GPM because that's what it really requires to get the motor started. And that's because most boilers have a little bit higher startup firing rate than they turn down to. And so you want to make sure you're designing around the higher number, okay? Don't get yourself into trouble. So every boiler has a minimum flow rate, and here is why. A 2 million B2 boiler that starts up at 30%, and that's a good conservative number. Some boilers actually start up at 50% firing rate. Make sure you know what you have. Let's look at this 2 million B2 boiler we've been using in all our examples with a 140 degree set point. Now, we don't cut the boiler off at 141 and on at 139. We have what's called a set point operating range. So in this particular instance, we're going to use a 12 degree range. This is not your delta T for design. This is the operating range around set point. We want 140 degrees so that everyone in the building is comfortable. We want 140 degree supply. But there's not a big load. We're going to meet that. And so we want to allow the loop to get up to 146 before we shut the boiler off. And then we're going to allow the boiler to cool all the way down to 134, that 12 degree range. Six degrees above 140, six degrees below. So it's off at 146 and the boiler comes on, cuts on at 134 degrees. This is sort of our set point operating range. It's important. That's adjustable by the way. Most boiler manufacturers will allow you to program that at startup. You can adjust that for five degrees, the 12 degrees, the 20 degrees, whatever you desire. But that's gonna also mean there's more fluctuation in your boiler loop, okay? So we wanna use some sort of dead band, some sort of set point control range around the set point. And here we're gonna use 12 degrees in this example. The manual reset high limit here is 205 degrees, and that is a safety set on the boiler. We don't wanna trip the manual reset high limit. We don't wanna put 205 degree water in our loop. Our expansion tank probably wasn't sized for it, and also it can be dangerous. So to protect the boiler, we have a manual reset high limit. Now what does that do? If the manual reset high limit trips, if you put out 205 degrees or something hotter, that boiler is going to shut down, and it will not start again until someone drives to the job and mashes the reset button. It will be down until someone physically goes to in front of the boiler and mashes a physical button. If this is at a school or a commercial building or a process that you design, how long is it going to take someone to get down there and hit that button again before we are back up and doing comfort heating or process heat? We don't want to be down. We don't want angry customers and clients who do not trip many recent high limits. <clears throat> Regardless of what your boiler manufacturer tells you, every boiler is going to have a minimum flow rate. So let's figure out what the minimum flow rate is for this particular boiler. It's 2 million BTUs, remember? And you remember our formula there? for determining BTUs per hour is 500 R constant times GPM times the delta T. Well, we already know the BTUs. It's 600,000, that's 30% of 2 million. And we also know the delta T. Not our design delta T, but our operating range. And we're gonna set that at 12. So if we do that, this is our formula and we'll just solve for GPM. Well, if we put in this formula and solve for GPM, the minimum flow rate at startup for this particular project is gonna be 100 gallons a minute. The 2 million B2 boiler is going to need 100 gallons a minute 
at startup just to get cranked up and turned on before it can start turning down if it has a 30% startup firing rate and you have a 12 degree operating range. Well, what did you design for? What did the boiler manufacturer's literature say? Maybe they assumed you had a 20 degree operating range or maybe they assumed you were going to pull all the BTUs out. What would happen if you designed for 15 GPM? Well, let's take a look. Got 15 GPM coming into my boiler. I have 500 times GPM times a delta T. 600,000 BTUs at startup. I plug in my 500, my, my 500 constant and my 15 GPM, and I solve for the delta T, right? Mm. What are we going to get? 227 degrees. We've made steam, or we've tripped the manual reset high limit. Two things we do not want to do. It's a dangerous situation. This boiler wouldn't just short cycle. It would trip off and shut down. Remember before, we were just solving to prevent short cycling. We needed 100 GPM just for that. So what did you design around? Which product did you specify? Let's take a look at some boiler minimum flow rates then based on this 12 degree in temperature control range we were talking about. Again, there's our 2 million BTU boiler at the top at a 30% firing rate. The minimum flow rate's 100 GPM. Well, at 2 million BTUs at 10% startup firing rate, the minimum floor rate is going to be 33 GPM. Which boiler did you specify? Did you design around the boiler with 10% startup firing rate? And did you accept as an equal the boiler with 30% startup firing rate? If you did, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have some operating conditions and some problems and maybe an angry client. Let's take a look at a million BTU boiler with a 20% startup firing rate. The minimum floor rate there is 33 gallons a minute. Well, which boiler did you specify? Did you pick a 1 million BTU boiler at 10% startup firing rate and you got 17 GPM required? And again, you might be in trouble. If you specified a startup firing rate of 30% and you accepted a boiler with a startup firing rate of 10%, you're probably not going to be in trouble. We can go all the way down to 500,000 BTUs at 10% startup firing rate will be a minimum flow rate of 8 GPM. And if you designed around that product, but you decided to accept a boiler that was 500,000 BTUs at 30% startup firing rate, then you're going to run into trouble because its minimum flow rate was 25 GPMs. Everybody get the picture, right? Make sure you know what you specify and what you're willing to design around or all the boilers that you're willing to accept as an equal. Which boiler do you think costs more? Which boiler do you think costs less? Higher turn down sometimes can cost more. Sometimes it might be the same price. Let's talk about buffer tanks for a minute. And why in the world would you even want one? And what does a buffer tank do? Well, buffer tanks are simply there because when the boiler output is higher than your minimum system load, we have to have somewhere to store the BTUs. Otherwise, the boiler loop temp is going to go up and we're going to short cycle. So if we can't get enough turn down on our boiler to get below the minimum load, we have to make sure we have enough water volume in our loop to absorb the BTUs. Again, typically it's not a problem, but every once in a while we can run into an issue, and so we want to make sure you understand where to put the buffer tank and how to size for it. Let's just say we need a buffer tank. Well, where, if we do need one, where are we going to put it? We can put it in the primary closest to the boilers, right? That sound, kind of sounds like it makes sense. We're going to be right near the boilers where we need them. Well, if we do that, then the tank serves no purpose at all when the boilers and the primary pumps are off. Well, we, all our load is out in the secondary loop. And so if we're pulling out BTUs there, but we don't see the buffer tank, the secondary loop doesn't pull out of the buffer tank, then we won't be able to use that buffer and those BTUs. And so the buffer tank won't serve any purpose. Well, well let's move it out to the secondary then where the BTUs are needed. Well, if we do that, then we run into the problem that the secondary flow rate is really low. Let's say we're at a low load period, which is typically when you need a buffer tank, then the boilers can short cycle or shut off due to high temperature limits because we're not pulling up BTUs out of that buffer tank at really low flow in the secondary. So for us, we feel like the best location is right here in the primary secondary connection. Make the buffer tank your primary secondary connection and be your decoupler. When we do that, then the boilers can see the tank and the secondary loop pump can see the tank and everyone gets to use and benefit from that big buffer of water. It provides that system volume to the boilers, even with the really low secondary flow rates. The nice part about having the buffer tank here is it also serves as your common pipe or your decoupler in a primary secondary system. And you can even use that as an air separator if you add an air vent. 
how do we know if we need a buffer tank? Well, how much system volume do you need? Well, here's an example. Let's take our 2 million BTU boiler again, right? And assume that it has a turn down of 4 to 1. That means that the minimum BTU output is 500,000 BTUs in this particular boiler. Now, the manufacturer is going to rec recommend a minimum run time, maybe 5 to 10 minutes. We say 10 minutes just to prevent short cycling. We'd like for you to bring the boiler on and allow it to run for a few minutes. Don't short cycle equipment. That ruins equipment. So here we are with our 104 degree set point again. And remember our 12 degree temperature control operating range. 146 degrees the boiler cuts off and 134 degrees the boiler cuts on. And let's assume a minimum load of about 50,000 BTUs. Now if you don't know what your minimum load is or you don't want to calculate it, assume zero. It's a great assumption. It will not get you into trouble. You might have a bigger buffer tank than necessary, but you won't be short flagging equipment and ruining the warranty. So, how do we figure out the system volume? Well, we're going to take that runtime we want, that 10 minutes, and we're going to take the difference between the minimum output of the boiler and the minimum load, and we're going to multiply those two. Now we'll take the tank temperature rise, which is that 12 degree operating range, remember not our delta T on the design, times our constant 8.33 times 60 or 500. And here's our answer. In this particular instance, with a 4 to 1 turn down, a 2 million BTU boiler, our system volume needs to be 750 gallons. So we can absorb all those BTUs when the boiler is at its minimum fire and we're at our minimum load. We've got to have a place to put that extra 450,000 BTUs. If you only have 600 gallons in your storage, in your volume, calculated in your loop, then you might need a 150 gallon buffer tank here to keep yourself out of trouble. Well, what if we have a boiler um, that has a 25 to 1 turn down? Interestingly enough, we sell those. 80,000 BTU minimum output. Well, same 10 minutes of runtime, same system operating parameters, 140 degree set point, 134 the boiler cuts off, 146 the boiler cuts off, and our minimum load hasn't changed at 50,000 BTUs, but now we have a difference of 30,000. Where do we put those extra 30,000 BTUs? We run our formula again, and we figure out that our minimum system volume in this particular application is 50 gallons. Could be the same exact system, same exact loads, same 2 million BTU boiler design. One has a high turn down rate and one doesn't. So keep in mind here, our fire tube product has a very large turn down rate, typically here 25 to 1 in certain sizes. Our water tube product has a lower turn down rate, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, which is often the case with lots of products out there. So if you specified a fire tube product and accepted a water tube product, you might not get the turn down rate you were expecting, and you might need to add a buffer tank. Keep in mind too that the water tube products don't hold as much water as the fire tube products. Thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, look us up at jmpco.com. Thank you. Bye-bye.